I'm Chantal Hernandez, and thank you guys for joining tonight. Um, CMC Sessions Inspiration and Influences is, is the collaboration between the Winds, Brass, and Cultural Traditions Department at Community Music Center, presenting CMC faculty sharing the inspiration and influences that have guided them as professional musicians and teachers. Tonight, we have the second session in our series, and we are with Irene Chagall, Melody and Line of My Life, Her Life. I'd like to mention that Community Music Center um, respectfully acknowledges that our organization sits on the ancestral and unceded homeland of the Ramatisha Loni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of San Francisco Peninsula and who are still living here today. We make this acknowledgement to create greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights as a step toward equitable relationships and reconciliation. Now I would like to share a media disclaimer. Please note that tonight's workshop will be recorded for documentation purposes. Um, if you wish to avoid the possibility of your image being recording, you can go ahead and turn your um, camera off. And I'm gonna start recording now, I think. All right. Yeah. And last piece from me, um, I'm gonna be sharing information in the chat about becoming a student at CMC if you're interested. And also the next CMC session, which is on April 13th with Miguel Govea and Susan Pena. Their session, how we became the musicians, we are, we will share their influences and, and their particular way of making music as a duet. So make sure you check the chat for those things. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Trigger. All right. Well, I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Um, and Chantel, if you can keep admitting people, it looks like a lot of people are asking to be admitted. If you can keep doing that, that's great. Thank you all for coming so much to this. Uh, I think we're in you know, our third year of doing these uh, CMC sessions. And I'm so excited actually to be having Irene here tonight because she has a very interesting some really great stories to tell. And she's been making music with children and adults for like a super long time, longer than we want to talk about us old folks. Uh, for 40 plus years, she, uh, she's taught music and puppetry um, in San Francisco, Marin County, Marin County, and pretty much on every continent of the world. Uh, she said, minus Antarctica. Um, and she's been a faculty at CMC, CMC since 1984, which, if my math is correct, is like 39 years. So it's a long time. Actually, I think it's longer than that. Um, she was a research associate with Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage from 2006 till 2009, and currently is directing Let's Get the Rhythm with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, Traditional Arts Division. She graduated from UC Berkeley, has a master's degree from Lone Mountain College at University of San Francisco. And, and she'll talk about all this, but uh, did intensive private studies in classical guitar with Maestro Jose Tomas in Alicante, Spain. Um, she also directed the film that I just mentioned, Let's Get the Rhythm, which premiered at the Margaret Mead Film Festival at the American Museum of Natural History in 2014, followed by a screening at Lincoln Center's Dance on Camera in 2015. Uh, the film won the Best Documentary Award at Dance Camera West in 2015, and also San Francisco dance film festival impact award in 2015 um i always ask the presenters to give me some like self observations and stuff they might not want to say about themselves that um you know we don't like to brag about ourselves but some things that we might want to let folks know and these things came out of conversations with her and um, <clears throat> she's, she's really one thing I've gotten to know Irene uh, putting this together and she's really someone who embraces wit and irony and 
you know, she said that wit carry wit and irony carry deep insights. Um, she also suffered a horrible back injury in 2017, kind of like myself actually, and couldn't even walk. And she's been rebuilding and kind of reassessing herself in the last few years. And this presentation that she's really, um, she's going to give us her, her, what she's been doing uh, and the most important things in, in, in her life and in her career as a musician and educator. Um, so this is part of that rebuilding, you know, that can be rough. Um, I also want to let you know that we're going to be having a question and answer session at the end of this and uh, for the last like 10 minutes or so. So if you have any questions, please write them in the chat. I don't know if you guys know, I think everybody knows uh, Zoom good enough now that, you know, there's a chat button at the bottom. So go to the chat and push just everybody and write your questions in. We will compile the questions and get to those questions at the end of the session and address every question so that uh, <clears throat> Irene can uh, uh, address the questions and answer your questions. And we can have a little uh, uh, back and forth at the end. You might have to, and also I wanted to let you know that some of the audio isn't is at the exact same level. So you might need to turn up your your speakers or down or something uh, during the presentation. So just know about that. Uh, the first thing we're going to hear, we're going to start the presentation now. But she wanted to do this, which I think is really cool. We're going to just start off just listening to a piece of music that she'll talk about after. Um, uh, after it goes by, it's just about a minute. Go ahead, Chantel. Hill and gully rider, hill and gully, hill and gully rider, hill and gully, and it's been and down, gully. low down, hill and gully, and you'd better watch your tumble down, hill and gully, hill and gully rider, hill and gully, hill and gully rider, hill and gully, and it's been down, low down, hill and gully. And you better watch your tongue down. You hill and gully, hill and gully, hill and gully. So that was Hill and Gully, Hill and Gully Rider, which is a Jamaican folk tune that invites people to join in uh, in the simplest way. The chant response. Hill and Gali is one pitch, and it also has a syncopation in it, so it makes for rhythmic interest. Uh, it also, in its wonderfully simple way, says a whole lot, because life is full of ups and downs, and we do have to be careful with the, the, when we fall down, but we can get back up and ride again. Uh, next slide. Next. Chantel. Um, influences and inspirations. Um, this is me with an opportunity that I had to sing with Pete Seeger at the Library of Congress. It was a symposium for the Seeger family and all that they had done for American music. And I got to sing because I knew the words to De Colore. So it was right up my street. And um, obviously it was a wonderful moment and a wonderful joining of musical minds. Um, Pete Seeger uh, to me represents um, integrity, um, professionalism, talent, and uh, genuine care about the community. Next. Uh, 
Um, Pete Seeger was honored with a U.S. postage stamp this last year, and um, before that, another great influence in my life was Ruth Azawa, was also honored with a postage stamp. Uh, I had my breakthrough in working with the San Francisco Public Schools through Ruth's program called Alvarado Arts and um, was encouraged both with my music and the intersection um, of uh, visual art. Next. Um, a moment of special um, recognition to the Guild Shop in Madrid that produces classical guitars, um, Redwood classical guitars, the Ramirez guitar is known around the world. Uh, Segovia was partial to the Ramirez shop and through the people I studied with in Spain, um, I was able to get a Ramirez guitar um, while I was there in 1967. Next. So here I am in in Spain. Um, geez, is uh, the picture with uh, Tomas is not there? Okay. Anyhow, um, I was thrilled to be in Alicante, Spain, um, uh, pinching myself to believe I was real. But you can see this in 1966. Um, I had two years at UC Berkeley um, and decided I needed, well, I'd actually been planning to do this thing uh, of going to Spain from, oh, the 11th grade in high school. It was kind of under the radar, but I switched from studying French to studying Spanish and I kept playing the guitar. <laughs> UC Berkeley did not recognize the classical guitar as a legitimate musical instrument. So I wanted to do what I wanted to do and I didn't want to be um, getting arrested anymore. I was arrested in the free speech movement and um, it was the Vietnam anti-war and it was um, um, LSD was becoming regularly available um, to students around Berkeley. Um, <laughs> the picture on the right, um, this is me with, um, I rented a room from a Spanish family. And as you can see, I tower over the other people. I may look Spanish but when I'm sitting down, but when I stand up, it's clear <laughs> I'm quite a bit taller. Next. <laughs> And this is Christmas dinner. You can see the table just couldn't have any more on it. Um, but it was um, the family gathering. Next. Um, on the left, you see a woman dressed in a jalaba, uh, which is the street um, dress of Moroccan woman, women. Um, I visit, I had a cousin who was in the Peace Corps in Morocco at the same time, and I went to visit and um, I had to see what it felt like to be a Moroccan woman. On the right, on my way home, I picked up some kind of a bug and um, that's at Gibraltar. And I um, <coughs> have to say I, I got on the um, the train in Algeciras um, uh, feeling quite ill and uh, made it all the way back to Alicante, which is where I was studying the guitar. And um, a week later, I woke up and I couldn't find my traveler's checks. So I'd lost about $100 worth of traveler's checks. And after I turned over, the bank would, that I'd bought them from in Spain would not acknowledge them. And my, my guitar maestro, Jose Tomas, tried to talk to the, um, them and they, they didn't budge. And I talked to the station boss at the train station and I talked to um, the 
who wired the station boss in Madrid where the, because I changed trains, still didn't get it. There, I lived about four blocks from the train station. Maybe I dropped it in those low, last four blocks. I went to the police to see if anybody had turned them in. And it turned out the police ha um, asked me to come back the following day uh, because they were busy. Um, they had a prostitute ring they were busting or some such thing. And I went back the next day and they had my checks. And it turned out that the people in my compartment on the train had turned the checks in to not to the station boss in Madrid, but to the state to the um, to the station police. And the police in Madrid had wired the Alicante police to let them know that they had my checks because they my checks were stamped saying that I had purchased them in Alicante. So I turned over the last stone. Um, actually, I found a lucky peseta and I, it turned out that it was lucky. And um, I got the traveler's checks back. Those checks covered the difference in the price between the guitar I was thinking I was going to buy and a Ramirez. So I obviously just said, well, that money was lost and now it's going to the Ramirez. So um, that's, um, then um, my brother and his wife came over to visit my cousins also in the Peace Corps. And we hatched a plan where I would uh, fly from Alicante and meet them in Alger. Um, and um, this is, um, it was, um, what 1966 and the, the Algerian revolution ended in like um, in the late 1950s. So it, the independence was probably six to eight years old at that time. <laughs> Next. So the big thing is, is when I got to, to um, when I got to um, Algeria, um, I had not thought ahead about anything except that I had to get to Alger. Well, Oran, where the plane landed, was about 400 miles from Alger. And um, I thought, well, you know, there'll be a youth hostel or something. There was nothing. Women don't um, travel like I was traveling in um, and I was stuck because they spoke French and I spoke, um, I was just getting comfortable in Spanish. But in high school, when I spoke French, studied French, I had to memorize a poem uh, from uh, 16th century France, La Cigale et La Fourmi. It's the story of the ant and the grasshopper. And I'm going to recite it right now. So, um, Chantelle, instead of showing the slide, you might want to put my face. So, la cigale y enchanté tout l'été, c'est trop fort pour des prévus quand le guise fut revenu. Pas un seul petit morceau de mouche ou de vermisseau. Elle a la crié famine chez la fourmi, sa voisine. Le priant de lui prêter quelques grains pour subsister jusqu'à la saison nouvelle. Je vous paierai le lui dit-elle, avant l'eau, frère d'animal, enterré et principal. La fourmi n'est pas prêteuse, c'est le son moindre des faux. Que faisiez-vous autant chaud, dit elle à cette emprunteuse. Nous y est jour à tout venant, je chante, ne vous déplaise. Vous chantiez, j'en suis fort aise. Eh bien, dansez maintenant. Okay, so this is a, um, the story of the ant and the grasshopper and the ant, the worker, um, has no tolerance for the fact that the grasshopper sang all summer. Well, I'm somebody who grew up in Southern California and um, the version of, of the ant and the grasshopper story that I recall, the ants invited the grasshopper in to make music at a big hoedown type of ball. And which was a much friendlier attitude toward the musician than um, the 
French version of the poem. And I mention that because um, it, it was kind of a, I won't say an aha moment, but it was a formative moment in my deciding that I wanted um, somehow, you know, I got everybody to join in. Everybody had to memorize the same poem in school. And that was, that was an eye opener for me. I thought the teacher who assigned my memorizing these poems was um, how do I, a lazy teacher just making us memorize poems. So, um, you know, my attitude changed. I, I heard <laughs> the teaching value of the poem. And um, it also made me think, you know, I, I enjoyed doing this. People came, <laughs> found somebody who could help me, gave me a place to stay, took me to a couple of movies, um, The Sound of Music and The, the Beatles, um, Hard Day's Night, dubbed in French. So um, very interesting experience and a way to launch a trip um, in North Africa. Um, so now go back to the um, last slides that you just showed. Okay, so um, my plan had been to, to hitchhike up through Italy back to Spain and get serious with my new Ramirez guitar. But my brother and his wife, who um, kind of are standing in the middle of uh, the picture um, to the right of the car that's in the, in the picture. Um, and they had this idea that they were going to caravan to Black Africa. And the man who's standing next to me is a Canadian guy. And we decided that we would he would accompany me back to Spain um, after we saw my brother and his wife off. Well, things didn't happen that way because the first day I'd ever hitchhiked, um, I had left my purse in the car. And um, it, um, the, when we reported it lost, the police helped us find a place to spend the night where we didn't have to spend money because I'd lost my traveler's checks, um, birth certificate, um, passport. Um, and my meds. So um, it was, um, I was in a pretty precarious position. The following day, we got picked up by Haj Saeed Yaoub, who in the picture on the right is the one with the white hat on his head. He's a rug merchant um, and um, made his rug sales were predominantly in France. So he was um, a little bit more well-traveled than a lot of people in that area. He also, um, having the name Hajj meant that he had made the pilgrimage to Mecca. And um, he, he picked us up hitchhiking and took us as his private guest. This is a, a couscous feast um, and um, maybe of note was there, a, um, they often eat just with their right hand. And in this circumstance, we were given spoons to eat out of the common bowl. Uh, Haj Saeed Yaoub took us as his guest and offered to, to me a place to stay while I got my paperwork uh, straightened out back in Alger, but it turns out we stopped in the town where I reported my purse was lost. Um, you wanna, next slide. Okay, um, and you'll see I'm on the far right and um, I have a shoulder bag, which made it difficult because the word I knew for purse in French was sac à main, and I didn't know how to explain that this shoulder bag um, was actually part of the Spanish Civil Guard uniform that I'd picked up in a flea market, okay? Um, the good news was that um, the chief of police had this story about these two crazy hitchhikers, one from Canada, one from the United States. They barely knew each other, and the woman left her purse in the car, and um, the person he was entertaining was the sub -prefect effect of police of the district. And he said, it sounds like two hitchhikers I picked up. 
and he went and looked in um, the back seat on the floor of his car and my purse was there and I got everything back. Now, um, I'm going to say that um, that just doesn't happen every day. I was extremely lucky. Um, the, I want, the other picture, I love it because this well um, that Hajj Saeed Yaoub is taking me to see. Um, it's like the, the kind of wells that we studied in the seventh grade when we learned about shadoofs in, in uh, Egypt. And um, so much of the lifestyle in uh, that part of the world, there's many aspects of it that still haven't changed. Um, in L Libya, the um, shepherds would load their sheep into a huge Ford van and take their transistor radio watches and go out to the pasture instead of just, <laughs> so they, they widened the territory where their sheep could graze. That was about it. Next, next slide. Um, I did have the hitchhiking bug. It was a way to get around this. This was in the days of uh, Europe on um, maybe $3 a day. I mean, it was doing the poor man's jet set was um, a way to see the world. Commercial jet flights had just opened up. Junior, junior years abroad were just coming into being. Uh, something that was part of an American college education. Um, in Finland, the newspaper stopped us and asked if we could have our picture taken. And then they sent me a copy. <laughs> Next. The Finnish family that picked me up um, um, also sent me these pictures. Um, they, uh, we went up to Hammerfest, which is the northernmost town in the world. And then we went back to Helsinki, where um, I had an authentic Finnish sauna. And it did everything you ever... Um, I felt so clean and invigorated afterwards. It was really wonderful. Next. So I came back, um, I, I didn't have the approval of my family or a source of income to continue my Wilde um, Chaya, my wild days. Um, but I came back and I finished my degree. And the first job that I got was teaching guitar in a public high school in Concord. And um, at the time, my music education was had not been uh, on the level of studying theory or composition, or um, it had just been actually playing the guitar. So um, I took a music theory class in UC Extension, and I mentioned it to the man who taught it, and he told me about a master's program, but I would have to have a double major of uh, I said, well, that's great. I got music and theater. I, I love the whole idea. And um, I enrolled at Lone Mountain College and tried to squeeze you know, four years of music theory into a year and a half. And I wrote a minstrel play called Bell Jangles and the Giant Bagel. And it um, was all in rhymed couplets and it incorporated uh, both songs and classical guitar, and uh, told the story of Belle Jangles, who was um, about to go on her mission in life to find her meaning. And the characters, um, there was a merry godfather, and uh, one of his lines was, Midjikaboogaloo dooby doo, abracadabra, I love you. Bibbidi bobbidi tweedly dee, you're going to fall in love with me. And there was also a um, fairy Yiddish mama and a dragon, Sir Nose, who had stuffed sinuses. So it, it was fun and it was delightful. And um, then I also wrote a thesis on the history of minstrels in medieval Europe. Next. So that and the one, picture on the left is my concept of 
what I'm like as a minstrel. And then I started um, trying to uh, promote myself as a performer. Um, and um, those are some of my promo pictures. Next. Um, I'm doing um, education in the schools, assemblies. Um, the San Francisco Symphony had, um, wasn't long after Davies Symphony Hall first opened. And um, I went with a the Jewish Center Nursery School to a concert. And afterwards I wrote a letter saying, giving them some suggestions about how to make the children focus better when they come to the symphony. And um, they hired me to help write the notes that they sent out to, to teachers. Next. Um, this is me working at one of the schools in San Francisco. Um, the um, world map in the background is an essential part of my musical presentations as I present music from around the world or shared material from around the world. Next. Uh, I also trained um, beside the, the degree um, education, um, I got ORF Schulwerk certification and the pictures on the right um, show me doing some of the dance demonstrations. And I went to Ghana um, and uh, went to a drum and dance school while I was in Ghana. And um, I'll talk a little bit of, more about that when I come to talking about my documentary film. Next. So I have this underlying theme <laughs> of the reclining lady, the reflective, um, intelligent, um, but, but I, I'm gonna say somebody who's tuned into um, the sensuous side of life. The picture on the left was taken in Morocco when I got to try somebody's uh, caftan on. And the picture on the right came to mind. Um, it, it's one, um, my first reclining lady picture. Um, it was taken in my grandmother's backyard back in about, I'm gonna say 1950. Next. So this is, this is what, I idealize being the reclining lady is. This is a Matisse um, painting that's titled Odalisque. And um, uh, um, there's some music here. And that's a lute piece from the Italian Renaissance called Bianco Fiori, which I think means white fire, but I'm not 100% sure. Next. And there I am trying to be that lady. <laughs> Next. And here I am. Um, on and on and on. This is a quilt that my sister made and gave to me. And I think she captured a lot of my personality and um, had a lot of fun doing it. 
Um, but once again, th this image of myself as a reclining lady, I'm very comfortable. In fact, right now I am sitting on pillows on the floor. I teach sitting on pillows on the floor. Next. And of course, this is the Henri Rousseau picture, which I, it, it speaks so strongly to my love of the, well, mine is the guitar, but the, the stringed instrument and the strength of the lion in the background, but the lion is not threatening to the sleeping lady. Um, this picture hangs in my bedroom or a replica of it. <laughs> Next. Oh, was there, was, there was music with that. And that is another uh, of the Italian lute suite pieces. Um, and I think it's titled Semi Accord Joe, and I do not know the translation of that title, but it's a beautiful piece of music. Next. Um, I was wanting to do something for the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty, and I was all um, up with holding the torch and the photographer who just says, hey, relax a minute. And he got this picture. Um, and anybody who'd like a copy of this one, I have like about 300 copies of it um, sitting on the shelf in my office. Um, anyhow, next. Would you like the music with this one? Oh, is there music on this one too? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is the entertainer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And I absolutely love the entertainer on the guitar. It feels like it was written for the guitar. It just feels so right. I um, really enjoy being able to play that piece of music. Next. And there's just one more reclining lady. This is in the foothills of the Sierras and um, the earth speaks to me. Uh, next. Oh, and here it is in later years, um, once again, that, that um, sitting, relaxing, and thinking about the finer things in life, maybe a glass of wine on the table, um, and, um, but um, you've seen pictures of me from the time I was three or four years old, and now this one, I'm, I'm like in my 70s. So. Um, it's a long, interesting life. Um, next. Um, here's a reclining lady, and I'm convinced that she's not asleep, but she's paying attention to what's going on. Um, the photograph was taken the um, evening uh, following the last total eclipse. Uh, which was, I think, August 2017. And um, on the right-hand corner is a quilted uh, piece that I made myself to try and capture the beauty of what I saw. Um, and the reclining lady concept. Next. So this is an original song that I wrote. And one of the things that has struck me about um, the um, going over all my music is I have a tendency to really like compact lyrics um, and wit. And so this was an attempt in the 1980s to write a folk song in a period when um, Commercial values were were coming to the fore. It was the Reagan years. Not that that affects this particular song, but let's have a listen. The marina Safeway is the trendy light. There's a single show every Wednesday night. It's been featured on the evening news. Cause the shoppers come by ones and leave by twos. At the Safeway by the bay. At the Safeway by the bay. See the produce on display. At the Safeway. Little Whooper, the Marina Safeway with the S in super for marketing. 
So that's that's a little taste of, of some of my songwriting. Next. This is my work at CMC. Um, I, if people want to remember me, this picture is a, the way I want to be remembered. I am having so much fun with the kids and I hope it shows. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to skip over um, the CMC teaching things because I want to show the trailer to my hand clapping documentary. Um, so um, Chantel, can go we quick, go quick? Okay, this. Yeah, let's, let's see the kids quick. Okay. That, this is traditional me, Halloween every year at the center. Here's a cigar box gar guitar that um, um, we made as part of um, thinking about what was the first musical instrument and how musical instruments get made. Here's a clarinet student who came and did a demonstration on what it's like to study the clarinet. Next. Um, this is an original song. These are props. There's me getting crazy. <laughs> um, experimenting with rudimentary instruments, blowing bamboo, blowing horns, uh, conch shell, next. Um, a violin student coming in and, and showing the kids about what it's like to play the violin, next. This is taking advantage of the music cent what the music center has to offer. These are puppets that I've made and um, regularly appear. Um, um, the crow and the, the owl are from Rock and Robin. Uh, Taboo is a skunk that sprays, but she sprays something that smell uh, smells good. She's a party animal. Um, there's um, Juan O'Croc. Um, there's my nephew, Solly, with Chuck Wood and with Junio, his, um, um, what is it? Um, come on, um, 19th, um, um, celebration. I'm going to... Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Yeah. Thank you. Next. Uh, this is Shelly. She's the only store bought puppet I use and her babies. Um, next. Okay, so this is my documentary film. When I went to Ghana in 1998, I saw these three girls playing a hand clapping game and it stunned me because it was a pattern that's popular in California. And so I embarked on making a documentary film on little girls hand clapping games around the world. And both in making the film and in trying to market the film, I traveled um, on five different continents. Next. This is a picture of uh, screening um, the New York Times article um, about the Lincoln Center screening where the Gia Corliss, the dance critic from the New York Times um, um, calls it a, um, an excellent documentary. Next. There's what I call a line of things that children do. Sleep, then eat, then watch TV, then video games. Then there's watch movies, buy new clothes, and then there's hand games, and then there's eat lunch. I think clapping means are really fun because yeah. you don't need it. You just need your hand. Most people think of children's material as trivial and inconsiderable. I very much disagree with that. When you was younger, you have to be up to date with your games. You have to know them. Everywhere you go, you always have like a different version to like a, a hand clapping game. It's really addicting, and the rhythm gets stuck in your head. I see you with my own eyes when somebody do it, and then I try to copy it, and I get it. They're complicated games. They have a bit of the gender stereotypes in them, but we're the people saying them. What do you think those words mean? They lasted through migrations. They lasted through wars. There's something in our consciousness. There's 
That's Hungarian. This picture is here because the sweatshirt the girl is wearing, I have one that's similar and the colors just reached out and grabbed me and I found out the story. There's white lines in it that represent the whale migration. It The sweatshirt was made as a fundraiser for the First Nations people of Australia uh, to uh, sponsor, um, support a tutoring program so the, the uh, First Nations people would get their educations and get help with their educations. Next. And that was in Rwanda. Um, I was uh, awarded a um, Hayes Fulbright grant to go to Rwanda with my film to the Rwanda Film Festival. And I visited an Islamic school. And after seeing the documentary, the girls got up and did one of their hand claps. But it turns out their hand clap was um, the ABCs. <laughs> Next. Oh, and this is my um, cat, Apollo. I adopted cats during COVID and um, Apollo is the one who's fascinated by the piano and he's learning about middle C right there. And I'm glad he did it there instead of here. This is a crosswalk in downtown Warsaw. Um, I think a salute to Chopin and the um, other famous Polish pianist, Wanda Landowska. Um, but my first take was, oh, you know, a zebra crosswalk. Oh, it looks like a keyboard. Oh, it, it is a, painted like a keyboard. And I thought it was just a, a neat piece of public art that I wanted to end with. Thank you. All right. So um that was great irene thank you for sharing so much um we can't hear the applause because we turned <laughs> the sound is turned off except for me and thank you for keeping the sound off we did have a couple questions we just got like another four minutes or so um um and if anybody has a question they want me to ask irene Please put them in the chat right now. We did have uh, a few questions. Um, let me see if I can find here. Um, how was the experiences? One question was, how were your experiences that you showed in 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 the film, whether it be in Africa, in in the presentation, whether it be Africa or wherever, uh, affected the way or the teaching methods that you use with children, in particular, early childhood education? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question, but I would say that, that I started to tune into I, um, ways of engaging people in the activities and opening their minds to different sounds. So, um, you know, I found my, myself in several different situations where um, there was no language for real communication, but when music happened, it was possible to sing the same song and to feel the resonance with other people. So um, I always go back to that basic, you know, how do you get, how do you establish trust with other Wait people. a minute. When you said there's no language for communication, does that mean that you were working with kids that you didn't have a common language in between? Um, was the common language just music? 
And I, you know, um, when in Ghana, I was supposed to go into a school and I, um, I said, oh, I'll do a, the song, I am a pizza. Okay. Um, surely they'll get it. Well, this was a cultural difference rather, you know, they, they didn't have the vaguest idea of what pizza was, you know. There's so, no Ghana and pizza. You know, and, 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 you know, anywhere in um, Western Europe or the United States, you would know what you know pizza is not um it it's as common as peanut butter you know okay we have one more question and then it's almost eight so we're gonna have to stop but... I, and i have i have one one um oh. last thing to say too so all right oh uh, someone did ask i want to hear that for sure irene but someone did ask, what is next? And maybe this has to do with you, what you have to say. What is next for you in the world of art? Um, I'm working at trying to appreciate home um, with the same kind of awe that I appreciate the culture of other places. So I'm working on um, a woman's um, perspective of what it means to be Californian, because I think that my having been born and raised, educated in California opened me to the possibility of being able to travel like this. And um, it wouldn't have happened the other way. Yeah, you know, the privileges that us Californians have. Yes. Okay, so um, what I really quickly wanted to say is another tale that really, really involved me was the Pied Piper. I um, got exposed to the story very young and I felt like, um, you know, that Pied Piper should be paid. And um, I took a trip to Hamel because I heard that the city of Hamlin actually celebrates the story of the Pied Piper as a tourist attraction. And um, I got there and um, I was once again stuck. I it, Because it's a tourist thing, there was no hotel room available that I could afford. The man I was traveling with had stayed behind in Heidelberg because he just wasn't interested. And um, I was walking the streets of Hamel and trying to figure out, and I said, you know, 20 years ago, I was able to get across North Africa. I can do this. And I walked into a bar and I said, there was a woman bartender and I said, need Zimmer. <laughs> I need a room. And she got a room, um, kind of, it's like Airbnb. It was, um, I think I paid um, $15 for the night and um, it included a white cloth breakfast. And uh, the woman of the house came out and introduced herself to me and she said, Irene. And I, I, and I started, how did she know my name? And it turned out that her name was Irene. And, um, what was so striking was uh, Irene is the Greek goddess of peace. And I was not all that comfortable with being uh, in Germany. I, I still had feelings about the Nazis in World War II. And, you know, there were experiences that made me feel um, aware of anti-Semitism. But this particular moment when this woman and I said, you know, we have the same first name and we hugged each other and it was like forgiveness um, and opening to the future. And so, you know, whatever story, whatever song, the idea of the arts is, it is the beginning of opening the door to the future. Well, thank you so much, Irene. That's great. That's a wonderful thing. Oh, one more question, though. Um, this is actually a good question. Uh, Gilda asked, or Hilda asked, is let's get the rhythm shared on YouTube or is it available? Where where can we find let's get the rhythm? Um, it, it is on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, it's up on okay. YouTube free. Okay, so if we you should want to check that out. I'm going to check it out. If you need a CD, um, talk, contact me. I have like a half a dozen CDs left. Not Great. much, but it will work. 
And are you, Hilda also asked, or Gilda also asked, are you thinking of evolving it? I take that to mean, are you going to do a part two or something or? <laughs> um, at, at this point, you know, I, I hit the time when, when video came down to being available at consumer level. Now everybody has their own. Um, I, I would love to see more happen with the, the documentary or not so much even the documentary, just with the concept that hand clapping is a very spontaneous and special way of bonding between two or more people. Uh, sharing rhythm, it really brings home how sharing rhythm, I think the, it stirs oxytocin. I, you know, um, if you're going to get intellectual, it's feel good stuff. Yeah, they were saying like to add to it or expand on it. And uh, also someone else said, come to Canada, our home is yours. I thought that was very sweet. Um, well, you know, we are going to have to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Chantel, do you have anything else to say? I was going to say that, I'm, unfortunately, we only got one hour and we've been going for, it's 8.04. But uh, um, Irene, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we end this? Yes. Because I don't want to just cut you off. I really don't. What I'd like to say is a place like the music center has been, it's been my safe place. It's been uh, a place that's encouraged me to go in my own direction with the music. It, um, and even in putting this presentation together, I have felt that word community. Um, I felt the, the positive results of being part of a community and um, it's a blessing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Working at the music center is a blessing and being a teacher is a blessing. And we have to count our blessings, right? Um, so thank you for saying that. That's very beautiful. And speaking of blessings, we also have, I'm just going to do a little promo now. We have uh, Miguel Govea and his longtime partner, uh, Susan Pena, is going to be doing something in two weeks, uh, two weeks from tonight. And they're kind of been doing, I mean, one of the things I loved, Irene, about you putting this together is that, you you know, the idea was inspiration and you you just uh, kind of put the, some, a lot of high points of your life and, in, into one presentation and it was so beautiful to see. And I know Miguel's going to be doing that also. Uh, and Susan. And Susan, of course. So... I hope to see everybody back here. Uh, if you guys want to see this or you have any questions, or if you want to have any questions for Irene, you can just, uh, actually, I'm not sure how to do it, but you can <laughs> just contact the center and talk to the registers or something, and they'll, they'll, they'll get the messages along. Uh, Chantel, do you have anything you'd like to say or, uh, or Irene? I guess not. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you for your support. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Irene, for putting, I know you put a lot of time into this and it was a wonderful presentation. So thank you for, for thank you for sharing your life stories with us. It was a beautiful thing. All right, goodbye everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Trigger. Thank Welcome. you. Thank, Thank you, Miss Irene.